So, um, hello, I'm Nick, and I'm going to talk about what's going on on the Trusted Execution Environment Workgroup on the Risk Five Foundation. So, uh, first of all, uh, what is the workgroup? So, the, the foundation has some committees. There is this technical committee where all the working groups or task groups are that doing technical stuff. And there are some other committees like the marketing committee or the outreach committee. So there is also the standing, the security standing committee that deals uh, with security in a larger uh, like perspective. So it's not security is not only a technical thing. It also matters for like uh, they try to, to create policies, for example, or guidelines. So these two groups, they interact with the security. We have the trust execution environment, and there's also the cryptographic extensions work group that works on uh, extensions for uh, and accelerating or implementing cryptographic algorithms and hashing algorithms, you know, all the well-known primitives. And uh, these two technical, for now, we, may, we might have more in the future, these two uh, work groups that are part of the technical committee, they interact with the security standing committee, and then, uh, for example, we usually have some uh, we have some tutorials going on. Some uh, um, we, it, it's it's a process for like creating not only technical uh, solutions but also like uh, policy uh, solutions. So, what's the task group? So it's uh, each task group has a, we have a working uh, space. And uh, this is one of the largest task groups right now on the foundation. Uh, and uh, initially there were two groups. The, it was the, the, both the cryptographic extensions and the trust execution environment. They went the same group and it was the largest group. So they split it. And uh, because security seems to be a big thing, I mean, a lot of people participate in these uh, working groups. And uh, we have like a 112 registered members, which is a lot of people. Uh, we work usually by uh, call, conference calls, like uh, once or twice, like two, twice a month, or maybe more frequently. And we also have a mailing list. Um, so the mission of this working group is to define an architecture specification for trusted execution environment or risk five processors. Let's start with that. So you know, uh, ARM has Trust Zone, Intel has SGX. We want something similar for RISC V, and uh, we want not only to, to uh, provide a mechanism for trusted execution environments uh, to be initialized, but to discuss uh, other aspects of uh, uh, how to protect uh, a, a flow, an execution flow. Um, and also, it's not because we're talking about a standard, we're not only we're talking about uh, creating a, a, a APIs or specs, we do not, uh, our goal is not only to, to, to um, it's not to provide one solution, like one implementation for everybody, but to give some set of guidelines and, uh, and specifications for them to implement or how things are, made, are done in a secure way in RISC-V. Um, and we want also to provide like uh, some reference implementations like an SDK or something so that people can use uh, that, that as a base to create their own stuff, something like the OpenSBI. We want something similar for a secure monitor, okay? Uh, so, what we're working right now, we have some uh, proposals on the uh, hardware front that we want to change some things there uh, that will help, will help in, our, uh, in our mission. And um, so, first of all, we have some modifications of the, phys of the physical memory protection mechanism. I'm going to explain what this is. And uh, the physical memory protection mechanism has, helps isolate uh, processes, execution environments, let's say, context is uh, from each other, but on, uh, it's not, it's, you know the virtual memory, like you have a, an address space identifier and when you do a context switch you change the address space. Uh, here we are talking about physical memory protection, so uh, it happens independently of the memory translation. So, and it also works for machine mode. Machine mode doesn't have a virtual uh, address translation, okay, it uses physical addresses. So we also want some, some way, this mechanism also protects, is able to protect uh, regions one when you are running on machine mode. Um, uh, so this mechanism, this mechanism is pretty strong, okay? Uh, because it happens on, on physical memory. It's like, um, you, you know probably uh, what ARM does for trust zone. It has a secure, uh, an, an area of your memory that the supervisor cannot touch. Uh, similarly here, you can have like, it's a physical region that 
applications cannot touch unless there is a specific register set that allows that. So basically if you have, what you can do is go and protect the physical memory region uh, when your application that you want to protect is not running so that anyone that goes that tries to touch this physical memory region either through memory translation or directly will get a fault. And when you want to run your application, you will have a secure monitor that will go and remove this protection. So your application runs now, it can see its own memory, and then you revert back. That's one of the uses of the PMP. Um, so, okay, we, can, we have a mechanism that protects uh, uh, applications or execution environments from each other, but we also want a mechanism for, for uh, isolating uh, devices from each other. Now, this is not part of the, of the core. Uh, so, and our job here is to talk about the ISA. So this is not part uh, something that we would expect to see in ISA because it doesn't uh, have to do with, a, with one heart or uh, there is five core. But uh, we, want to have a, uh, we want to have a proposal uh, for vendors that will implement a RISC-5 uh, uh, system on chips on isolating devices from each other. So the same way you ISO, we isolate processing and execution environment, we, have, we want to protect uh, the memory from other devices because there are attack vectors when uh, you can use another device for, for accessing the memory. Uh, so let's say that uh, your CPU now has PMP there, it cannot touch the memory, but your graphics card can do that or another DMA engine can do that for you. And you can use another, a third party uh, device to bypass this mechanism. So we have to also protect, to also provide isolation between devices. Uh, the last thing is also, I told you about protecting the flow of uh, an application. Now, when you do, uh, let's say there is a bug on your, on your code and someone can do buffer overflow and override your return address. This is a usual, this is a common scenario when doing uh, exploit development. So uh, this is what messes up your control flow. So what we want is to, to discuss about a control flow integrity extension. So this way, if someone tries to override your return address, he or she won't be able to make it. Uh, there are some, uh, ARM has something similar, and I think Intel has implemented something similar. We are talking about, uh, I'll explain a bit about it later. So this is on the hardware side. I'm going to talk about it, about these things a bit more lately, um, later on. And uh, on the software side, um, again, this is not part of the ISA, uh, as the SBI is also not part of the ISA, but we, are, we want to provide uh, an architecture on how a secure monitor will be implemented, like... Uh, the same way you have uh, calls from the supervisor to the firmware, for example, for, uh, through the SBI to, do, to trigger a, a timer or to do a remote fence or an API, we would want to have an API that uh, would say that would come from the supervisor or the hypervisor or from uh, an application to the firmware to do something uh, to mess with this PM, the physical memory protection registers to allow isolation and uh, to modify isolation settings or do something in firmware that you don't want to do in a, in a more, let's say, in a less trustworthy space. So for, think of uh, trust zone, okay, on our, oops, I talk too much. So uh, think of uh, trust zone on our, okay, you have, the, uh, you have the, some services running on firmware that, for example, can access ac uh, crypto accelerators or can access uh, private keys because they can read uh, if uses because they are on this high privilege level, equi the equivalent of our machine mode. So, for example, let's say that someone wants uh, uh, to, wants uh, to ask the firmware for uh, to encrypt something using these secret keys that no one else can see because firmware runs on machine mode. Uh, we want to have an API for that, or for an API for writing programs like that. Okay. Uh, And of course, together with the API goes the whole design, okay? You have lots of things. I'm going to give you an idea later on. So uh, let's say, let's talk a bit about the physical memory protection, what we have right now. So it's, par it's a part of the machine eyes. eyes. So your, your core needs to implement a privilege spec for this to be in there. And uh, the privilege spec says that uh, you have like up to 16 uh, regions to protect, but uh, vendors are free to implement more or less, okay, you can, for example, the SI5 board has eight, which is enough. Uh, other vendors might implement more regions there. The idea is, so um, the mechanism is the same. Um, and also, by the way, the privilege spec allows the vendors to implement another mechanism for physical memory protection. Uh, it's, this is just, this is the standard one. Um, 
So, the, the, so think of it as IP tables, but instead of IP addresses, you're having uh, memory addresses. Okay, so when someone goes to write or read or execute something on memory, uh, it starts, it passes through this firewall. Uh, and this firewall is for 32-bit addresses on uh, the 32-bit uh, RISC-V and for 56-bit addresses on RV64. You don't get the full physical uh, addressing. You get 50, uh, so uh, even on 64-bit uh, the CPU, you get 56 bits of uh, physical address, addressable. Um, there are four uh, ways of of uh, matching an address, these addressing matching modes. Here are some examples. Um, uh, on, it's how to, how you describe, uh, because you want to describe a range of addresses, okay? You don't want like one uh, specific address. So there are some, uh, there are some modes to describe this range of addresses. You can have like, uh, uh, you can describe it in one, reg in, one uh, in one register by having this, uh, uh, by having this, this uh, in, in natural aligning power of two regions, for example. Uh, or you might want to split it to say uh, start and end, so you need two registers to, uh, to, to talk about, to describe the register range. Um, and these are the bits you have on each of the configuration registers, what, you can, uh, what permissions you can assign when an address matches, and you can assign the read, write, and execute permission. And there are also, there are also these, uh, these other bits here. I'll talk about the lock bit later on. Um, but you, you get the idea. This is a logical diagram of how PMP works. Um, it seems a bit complicated. Uh, I have it here for your reference because I, I understand that this is not readable. Um, but uh, what I want you to, to get from this is that uh, the PMP beca behaves differently when you are on machine mode than when you are on other uh, on supervisor and user mode. Uh, so when you have a rule, when you have um, uh, in the current spec, because I want to tell you about the, why we want to modify this. In the current spec, when you get uh, an, an, a request for an address, it goes through this firewall, and then uh, the PMP mechanism sees if you are on machine mode or not. So if you are on machine mode, and there is no match, the, you get a successful, it allows you to access the memory. So let's say that I want to, add, to access an, an, an address range that is not, there is no rule for that address range. When you're on machine mode, this will succeed. When you're on, not on machine mode, this will fail by default. Um, which is, a, it makes sense. Uh, but uh, the other thing is that if there is a rule, for that range, and, it's, and you are on machine mode, you will still succeed. Uh, so basically, for machine mode, always uh, succeeds. The only way for machine mode to have a, a rule right now that prevents it from doing something is for the rule to be locked. So right now, we don't have the option of having temporary rules. Locked, a locked rule is a rule with the L bit here set, and it means that this, this rule stays there permanently. You cannot, you cannot touch. It's read the registers that uh, describe this rule. You need to hardware to do a hard reset on the on the hard, or the hardware thread. Um, PMP, by the way, is per hard, so you have a different set of registers for every uh, hard you have, uh, hardware thread or core, if you like. Um, so when uh, you, so right now, when you're on machine mode, which is the, these blocks here. Uh, if, unless a rule is locked is permanently, it will always uh, succeed. You will bypass the rule. So we want to be able to have uh, rules on machine modes that uh, will be enforced and that can be removed, that can be temporary. That's one thing. The other thing we want is for uh, um, the machine mode right now. Okay, I'll probably tell you about virtual memory protection first to, 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 to give you an idea why we, about the mechanism we want to, let's say, mimic. Uh, so. On virtual memory protection, uh, this happens uh, on supervisor mode, okay? So it's an extension, it's part of the supervisor ISA. Here we talk about physical memories after the memory has been translated, that we are trying to access physical memory. Here is when the supervisor or user modes use virtual memory addresses. Okay, so you'll get, um, so again we have 32-bit virtual addresses and 39 or 48-bit virtual addresses. And when RV128 comes, we'll have larger than that. And you, we have the usual page table. We have uh, 4K kilobyte pages by default. And we have also huge pages, okay, like 4 megabytes, 
uh, up to 512 terabytes. Okay. Uh, and it's table entry hardness again, read, write, and execute permissions as usual. And here we also have the U bit, the U permission on the page table entry. The U permission means that the supervisor, that this table entry, this memory region, is allowed to be accessed by user mode. Uh, if this uh, is not set, then a, a user mode application cannot touch this. So, for example, for kernel, kernel memory, we'll have this U bit to zero by default. So the user space will not be able to access uh, the kernel's memory. That's okay, but what happens if the kernel tries to access the user's memory? Is that okay? Um, by the, so lots of exploits uh, can use uh, a technique, uh, like if you find a bug in the kernel, and you can have, you can put your code somewhere, you can make the kernel execute your code with kernel privileges. Uh, so that means that when you, are on the, when you are on the supervisor mode, in our case, you will try and execute, an attacker will try and execute this mode that relies on user, on, on, on a memory range that belongs to a user, to a user application, okay? Now on RISC-V, this is, de uh, no, RISC -V, this is de denied by default, so uh, the supervisor cannot execute the user memory which is really good. Uh, but we'd also like to have this also have this happens. But we, we don't only want to protect uh, uh, the user memory from the kernel for, from execution. We might also want to protect this memory for uh, read and write, okay? So we don't want uh, the kernel to read and write uh, user uh, memory. Uh, so only, so this is when the sum bit comes. We have a, a bit on the S status register. Um, that says if the supervisor is allowed to read and write memory on the from the user space memory, uh, if this set is not if this bit is not set, then the supervisor not only cannot execute memory from uh, that belongs to a user space application, it cannot also do not read or write it. Uh, and there is also an, another bit there. I mentioned this for completeness here. When you if for the people that will read the slides in their free time, uh, so the MXR bit says that. Uh, Pages that are marked here, and uh, so if you have read, write, and execute. So if a page is marked as, as execute, with this bit set, is also treated as readable. Now this is only for virtual addresses, okay? It doesn't it doesn't deal with uh, PMP settings. So if even your PMP, uh, at least from the way the way it's written in the standard. So if this uh, bit is set, it doesn't mean that uh, you have to you can execute. Uh, 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 you, you can you can read uh, regions that are protected from PMP because PMP is on machine mode is a one layer above. So if the memory region is protected uh, uh, from execution, uh, this set will on the supervisor uh, mode will not override it. Okay, if you protect the memory from from, read, from reading, sorry, uh, with PMP even when this bit is set, uh, you won't be able to, to read it because the PMP that's one layer above that will f stop you. So, what we want to change to the PMP? Uh, so, first, I, I said I talked about this uh, thing that we cannot have temporary rules on, for machine mode. Uh, we, the only rules that can now be that are now enforced on machine mode uh, on machine mode are the rules that are locked. So, we want to be able to have temporary rules that are enforced on machine mode, and we can swap them on and off. This would allow us to have uh, isolation between things that are running on machine mode. On machine mode, we don't run only one. Uh, application, we might want to run multiple applications on machine mode. Uh, this is not only something to be considered as a trusted, from the perspective of, of a trusted execution environment, for example, that wants higher privileges, because you can have like uh, multiple, one, one scenario is to think that you have multiple trust, multiple services that run on, on the firmware and you want to switch from one service to the other, and they all want uh, higher, higher privileges than, privilege higher than the supervisor to speak to some secure devices, for example, or to do DRM and whatever. Um, another way to see this is if you are an embedded developer and you only have machine mode uh, or machine and user mode and you want to run something on machine mode that is not one application, something more complicated there. Uh, so you want to be able to have rules that are applied to the machine mode and you are able to swap on and off. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is that we remember the, the, the sum bit I, I talked about when, on supervisor mode when the supervisor cannot access uh, the user's mode. 
So we also want something similar for machine mode. So right now, someone might be able to find a vulnerability on the secure monitor or the, or the firmware and make the firmware uh, change a pointer or something and make the firmware execute uh, some user memory or some supervisor memory. Uh, now, we have a guarantee on the virtual memory that, uh, that you are not allowed to execute user memory, but on machine mode, we don't have any guarantee that machine mode will not try to read, write, or execute memory from that belongs to the supervisor or the user. So if someone finds a bug on the firmware, he or she might be able to make the firmware execute this piece of code with the highest privilege we have. Um, so we want to have something like the some bit I mentioned, that will also get rid of uh, the execute permission in this case because uh, execute permission, is, all permissions are allowed on a mode. A mode can, do, can do anything right now. Uh, so we want to have a, a global bit like um, as you to prevent machine mode from accessing the, uh, the supervisor and user memory or any kind of access. So, um, so that's why we tried, we will. Uh, add another status, another bit on M status on the register that we will call uh, the machine mode isolation bit. This proposal is almost finalized, so we are, we, we are looking at privilege spec 1.12. We hope this will get merged there. And uh, this is the new, this is the truth table. So we basically, uh, we want to be backwards compatible, obviously, so the, when the L bit is set, we want this uh, uh, rule to be enforced on machine mode as well. Uh, but uh, when the L bit, when the MMI bit is is set, this rule is enforced on machine mode, but not on other modes. Now, why we did that? Uh, think of uh, you might think of a rule that does not deny access, but allows access. So maybe we want to protect them. Uh, we want to allow something to machine mode that we don't want to be, to be allowed for the others in this way. For example, we want the machine mode to be able to execute the firmware code but not read it or write on the code. Um, so uh, this is the scenario we're trying to cover here. And this is the scenario I mentioned before. So uh, right now, if the log bit is zero, the rule will not be enforced on machine mode. But when the MMI bit is set, the rule will be enforced. Uh, the machine mode access will fail always. So basically, what happens with this bit is that when you do something on firmware, legitimately, and you return, you exit from firmware, you set this bit to one, and now there are no accidental, the firmware cannot mess with uh, uh, user or uh, uh, supervisor memory because, it's, because the PMP will, uh, will deny access, and um, physical, physical regions, okay, um, while you're running on these modes. And um, we're, we are Basically, this, is, this, this won't solve a security issue, but will prevent, obviously, if someone hacks the firmware, he also can s remove the entries there and do bad stuff. But um, we are trying to prevent buggy uh, implementations or some accidental reads and writes. It's, very sim it's similar to what the sum bit does, okay? If someone owns your kernel, they can obviously modify the page table, or they can create another mapping to the same region and bypass this protection. So this, this bit it does not, uh, the whole idea of protecting the lower levels, the lower privilege levels from the levels, uh, from the above levels is to be uh, proactive, okay? Because if you manage to, uh, to if, if you manage to take control of the higher privilege levels, then you own the lower levels, the lower, level, uh, the lower, lower privilege levels. Um, about the IOPMP uh, block I told you, this is a block we are proposing that will sit between, uh, so you have the code, we have, we have the CPU, inside each of the hard you have the physical memory protection mechanism. Uh, then you have the physical memory attribute checker, which is a, a kind of a, a PMP that's permanent and it's for all cores. I told you, I, I mentioned that PMP is per core. So there is also a mechanism that, that uh, acts as a firewall for accessing memory. Uh, that is for all cores and it's persistent, okay? Uh, the set, is, for example, uh, what, what this guy is doing is protecting, let's say if you're going to, if you're, if you're touching a, a ROM, for example, uh, it will not allow you to try and issue a write operation, you, okay? For, if you're trying to reach a device that doesn't support writing, it will prevent you from writing, okay? 
Um, but we can probably add more stuff here. The, the, uh, the standard uh, allows for the PMA checker to do more stuff. It's not very specific about what the PMA checker uh, is limited to. So um, we have the CPU protecting itself, let's say, and protecting one thread from the uh, one hardware thread from the other. Uh, but uh, we want to protect the devices also. So this is what the what the IOPMP block comes from. This is this block only handles protection. Okay, only it's only a firewall for physical address. So it will sit if you have an IOMMU that will present a virtual address space to your device. This block will uh, will sit after the IOMMU after the translation is done because it works for physical addresses. Uh, so this will sit after the IOMMU or between your device and the the, the system bus. Uh, and this block will. Um, the, the idea is that it will isolate devices from each other and from the CPU. Uh, now there is a catch here. Uh, the address, when, when, you, when the device does an access, that, that's when the IOPMP will work. Uh, because the addresses comes from the masters on the bus. They will not come when you try to reach the device. So uh, if this device, so you only firewall, you only have a firewall on the, on the outgoing traffic, let's say, okay? Uh, so if you have an incoming uh, connect, if you have an incoming grid here, so if someone tries to, if one heart tries to modify a, a register here, uh, then this block will not handle that, okay? Because there is, will not be, uh, this block will only handle outgoing traffic. The same with PMP, okay? But because it's on every core, uh, it, it, it does a job. Uh, so we have to find, uh, we have to discuss how we will treat MMIO accesses, how to protect the devices not only from reaching others, but from being reached. Um, so this is work in progress right now. Um, another thing is the control flow integrity. So I told you that there is this uh, type of exploits that uh, someone messes up with, your, uh, with the, your binary on the RAM, overrides the return address, and now when your code returns, instead of returning to the proper function, it jumps to some malware. Uh, so how do you protect that? Remember that I told you that in the, in the virtual memory protection, you have 39 bits on 64, okay? Uh, so you have some bits uh, left there. So, because the entry is 64 bit, but you can only use 39 or 48 bits. So, what you, you can do stuff with the rest of the bits on the virtual memory, okay? Uh, so, you can have like, uh, let's say we are using some bits that are higher than 48. These bits are not addressable. They, these addresses are not valid for the core right now. Um, so, what we can do is we can have. Uh, we can have addresses outside of the allowed range by using the higher order bits, virtual addresses, that only the call and the return functions can write to. So if you try to do a load or, or store on these virtual addresses, you'll get a fail. But when the call and the return function will run, they will go, the call function will go on this range and store the return address. And when the return function comes back, it will go there and remove it. So basically, you have something like a shadow stack that's there at all times, and uh, you cannot mess with it because only these two uh, calls can write and read there. Load and store will not work. And um, if someone tries to, uh, so they, they, if someone messes with your code and overrides it, uh, then when the return happens, it will go to the shadow stack and it will not find the proper return address, so it will block you. Uh, oh, of course, this is on virtual addresses. It can be when you work on machine mode, for example, that you are using physical addresses. We cannot have something like that. And it doesn't protect against all cases, but it's a decent uh, mitigation. Uh, so again, it's still work in progress. And about the secure monitors uh, architecture, now here is a lot of, a lot of work to be done. Uh, we have some implementations for secure monitors. We have one from uh, Hex5 that's called Multizone which is basically, it's, it acts like a hypervisor. It, it, it deals like uh, the whole memory is protected by default. And then it, uh, you tell the hypervisor to allow specific memory regions to give spe specific permissions to memory regions uh, when uh, your applications or uh, your environment will run. Uh, theoretically, theoretically, in one of these environments or in any of these environments, you can run a full operating system. but. This basically focuses on embedded devices when you, can, you want applications to be isolated from each other. Uh, 
So it's the, the cool thing with uh, multi-zone, it's very, very small. It has a very small overhead. It's a very small kernel, mostly written in assembly. They have open sourced most of, the, most of this. Uh, they have a library there that's, uh, again, but it's basically the code that they have in assembly anyway. Um, and they have open sourced some tools as well, so you can check these, uh, they work out. And uh, the, thing, the, the, the thing with multi-zone is that uh, when, you create the, when you create the firmware, you have to predefine these regions. So you cannot change them at runtime. If you want to have a new zone, you cannot ask the supervisor, the secure monitor, to create a new environment for you. You have static environments while you compile the thing. Uh, uh, then there is Keystone. Keystone aims to implement something like um, SDX, something that's more feature, that like has more and more powerful. It aims for uh, things that will run on the on a scenario that you, w that you would want to have dynamically created trusted execution environments. So you want uh, this, uh, the, the idea that I want to create a, a, secure in, a, a secure environment for running some process and then destroy it, and then ask for another one and destroy it. So uh, it's, uh, it, it, the multi-zone thing will not work with there because you have a specific set of uh, um, environments. This will, what you want with this is to be able to scale. So you might want to have a lot of uh, trusted execution environments. You might want them to be resizable. You might want lots of features when it comes to how you manage your trusted execution environments. And that's where Keystone comes into play right now. Uh, this, it's fully open source, by the way. And uh, it's, uh, it's been maintained by Berkeley people there and it's based on another uh, on another work from MIT called Sanctum which the, the Sanctum was also uh, also included some hardware stuff on mitigating side channel attacks it's pretty interesting work you can go to their side and read about it uh, so Keystone is like more feature proof like uh, so we have something like that looks uh, like a hypervisor and something that looks more like a, a secure monitor and uh, these, both these teams are members of the work group. Um, so we are having discussions with them and see where this thing goes. And uh, what we want to do is to have, to define some common APIs that both of these approaches and other approaches in the future can use and uh, come up with a set of policies, as I said, we don't create, we are, uh, uh, we create a spec. We do not create a lot, just uh, an implementation or an SDK. Uh, so there are all lots of areas when you, that need discussion, okay? So, for example, uh, not only the APIs, when we will need some interaction for, with the SBI, uh, for example, uh, the SBI group, because we will want some commands to be able to send to the firmware through the uh, new interface. Uh, we want to define a memory isolation sim using PMP, like how, you, how should you use PMP to protect, uh, to uh, do memory isolation? So we have a, a draft on that in, uh, for, for trusted execution environments, how to protect one execution environment from the another uh, using PMP. Uh, we want a memory isolation sim for the IO PMP, so how, because the secure monitor will also configure the isolation between devices. So we also have to provide a sim on how to do this properly. And um, then there are more serious stuff, like how do you, how do you, uh, do, uh, how do, you do this properly between hearts? For example, an attack scenario could be that uh, one heart would issue a command to reset another heart. When resetting the other heart, the whole PMP stack uh, goes because the register will be zeroed. And uh, you will be able to do something on the other heart without PMP, for example. Uh, so we want to be able to... There's also multi-threading in general. How do you, when you are on the, on the trusted execution environment, how do you do multi-threading in there? Uh, because it's the PMP mechanism is per heart, so when you switch, when you uh, uh, send something, to, so send uh, some job on another heart, you need to have the, you need to sync, the, um, you need to have the same PMP settings there as well, or the application won't be able to access its memory, or even worse, it will be able to access someone else's memory. Um, that's where interrupts come in as well. So we need to be able to to have a. a a sim on how to handle interrupts to the trusted execution environments or what happens when an interrupt comes and you are doing something secure. Um, and uh, these environments, how are we going to express them? Are we going to have an image format? Are we going to have uh, like only the binaries? It will just be an ELF binary. How we will, we want to discuss about having uh, a common like uh, description of a trusted execution environment. 
And of course, we have to write the code for it. Hope that we are very lucky that we have some implementations already there that we can uh, use or be inspired from. And we would also want to provide an SDK for people to use the same way that ARM and Intel have provided their SDKs for uh, Trust Zone and uh, SDK uh, and, uh, and SDX. Yeah. So that's all. Thank you. <laughs> so. Sure. Uh, um, I'm seeing in your list here of about um, end and secure storage, so stuff like EMMC, RPMB, and um, hub keys in the. It's not part of the CPU. <laughs> well, you have to have some keys in the CPU in some way to perform to either the handshake or the EMMC or something like that. Well, that's an implementation. Uh, an implementation. So if we have this like a spec, if you put this in the spec, let's say that people will be forced to do it. So uh, vendors might want to, do, to use different uh, ways of storing stuff. One, one vendor may want to have a secure ROM. Another vendor might want to have e-fuses. Another vendor might want, to, you, might want to have some encrypted uh, stuff on the beginning of their store, like a partition. You, we, we don't want to limit that. And uh, secure storage like encryption is not to be handled. Um, it's a software. It's, a, it's something that can be done for, for, from the software side. But if you think if you, if, you, if, the, if the firmware does it for you, then it, how how I mean for every for every transaction you'll have to go through the firmware. Uh, no, it's just I mean there's a root there was a root cert or a hash of a root cert that bur burned the the socks for actually. Yes, that's for secure boot. Sure. So I mean. Um, secure boot is part of our to-do list. Yes, sorry about that, but we are not there yet. There, so we we. So secure boot, is, there's a lot of, of discussion of how to do it. Uh, for example, do you do the, uh, is, it's a different approach when you're booting your own, your, yourself, when you're running, uh, when you're trying to, to secure boot and uh, a boot on, on the same CPU. And there's another approach where another, some other unit does the verification for you and handles the booting process. Uh, so again, we want to be flexible because RISC-5 is an open ecosystem. We don't want to, to limit people. And we want to have a, a specific scope. So if we try to say things about the storage or the memory, for example, you, can, you may have a row hammer attacks, okay? Or someone might tap into your memory. We cannot protect you from that. We cannot, uh, this is an implementation specific so thing. Is it a working group on the secure boot, boot stuff? Excuse me, there. Is there a mailing list and a group working on the Oh, the same, uh, we will. We, uh, secure boot is part of what we are uh, working on. So you may uh, subscribe to the list and. We just don't have a proposal yet for secure boot. We have a lot of discussion, but we don't have a, like one approach. Hi, I'm a PhD uh, in doing PG in security. A few seconds for that. Um, and in the academic world, Intel SGX is actually considered broken by design. I agree. <laughs> Well, first of all, if you read the, to be to be to be fair here, if you read the the SGX, they said that we don't protect you from side channel attacks. Okay, so they said it from the beginning. Uh, you may read the Sanctum, uh, that uh, that paper. Uh, all they, they, they work was on side channel attack mitigations, and uh, side channel again is something that you can it's something that has to do with design okay you, we can design for example the software to be uh, to be uh, secure against timing attacks uh, but uh, the other the other types of side channel attacks they are hardware specific which in our case is what it's an implementation bug let's say so we're trying to make the spec uh, properly secure and for the implementation have some guidelines for the, for them Oh no! You get a trap. You you get a trap. You get a illegal uh, like uh, access denied. Yeah, but where? I mean, usually it, it, it's a trap. Mm -hmm. Trap is being handled by a high operator. Well, this time uh, in this case, ah, uh, not really, because you 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 have trap vectors on uh, other mo modes as well. You may have uh, traps that are handled on secure on supervisor mode or on U mode. Uh, so that's not always the case. But in our case, yes, it gets trapped and it gets handled by machine mode as well. Ah, uh, okay, sure. Uh, we can talk afterwards. Great. Okay.